BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. First to Yemen, a fragmented country in all senses of the word, politically, socially and at war. Years of civil war morphed five years ago into a conflict involving proxy foreign players led by Saudi Arabia, who launched attacks on the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. The country's population has suffered from military action, economic hardship and starvation. Among the efforts being made to resolve the situation, some of the tribe's people are attempting to play the role of peacemaker. And Leila Malana Allen has been in the south of the country to hear the challenges they face. Driving out of Attack feels like a step into the unknown. The wide roads and low stone buildings start to fall away, seemingly piece by piece. They're half finished because the capital of Yemen's southern Shabwa governorate is in the midst of a construction boom. It looks almost as if the sand is fighting back, threatening to eclipse these little fingers of urbanization, probing into the desert's endless spread. We're on our way to meet representatives from some of Shabwa's dozens of tribes and sub-tribes. It's going to be a party tonight says our guide. Cross-tribal gatherings this big usually only happen when there's a war council. We head northwest, but it's soon hard to keep track of where we are, as the rising clouds of sepia sand mix with the burnt orange and livid purple rays of the setting sun, creating a thick haze as the wheels struggle to navigate uncooperative sand dunes. As dusk wraps around the expanse, we pull over and the sand begins to settle. Twinkling lanterns appear, illuminating a winding snake of a receiving line of men waiting to greet us, each in traditional tribal dress. Ma'awas, long loincloths, imama, wrapped embroidered turbans, and jambiyas, tribal daggers. They're all men. Tribal women don't attend gatherings such as these. Our guide is dressed immaculately and stands tall and proud as he pays his respects to the tribal elders. It's a stark contrast to his casual clothes and relaxed tone when I met him in the city. Well, of course he's on show, a Yemeni friend whispers. He's moved away, so they're all checking to see if he's taking good care of his grandfather's jambia. As we sit around rock-ringed campfires, munching on torn hunks of soot-blackened khabzil markad, a coarse wheat bread beaten out on the sand and cooked on the hot fire stones, the local leaders don't hold back. We're headless, says Alawi Ali Khalid, sheikh of the Khalifa tribe, bemoaning the fact that Yemen's president and most of his ministers have lived in exile since southern separatists seized Yemen's temporary capital of Aden in 2018. Since Yemen's civil war began six years ago, Shabwa has faced an invasion from the Iran-backed Houthi militia, air attacks from a coalition of foreign forces headed by Saudi Arabia and the UAE in efforts to push the Houthis back, and battles between multiple armed groups and central government forces. Yemen has been a theatre of political struggle for decades, and these men are no strangers to foreign interest in their lands. Ah, you could say you British know us better than we know ourselves, teases Sheikh Khalid, kneeling by the fire, his eyes sparkling with mirth as he tucks his ankles expertly beneath the hem of his robe. He's referring to the British presence in the country for more than a century until 1967, a colonial legacy that provokes mixed responses here. But the British, at least, he says, had the sense to appoint a local emir to consult with the tribes on important decisions. The newer power players here have done little to engage with the historic peoples of this land. Yemen's domestic politics is multi-layered, as Sheikh Khalid puts it. In the US, they just have the donkey and the elephant, referring to the symbols of the Democratic and Republican parties. Here, we have too many political animals to count. This has been compounded by an evolving proxy war. Iran backs the Houthi militias, who now run the most populous parts of North Yemen, and Saudi Arabia and the UAE support the central government. The UAE is also backing the separatists and local militias in the south, adding yet more complexity to the web of allegiances. You might have three sons from under the same roof, each a member of a different political party, or fighting in a different group, points out one tribesman gravely. Some even joined the local Al-Qaeda affiliate for a time, but that doesn't make them any less a part of their tribe when they return, 
leaving the tribal elders caught in a delicate dance to preserve stability while trying to stay above the political fray. The state governor is the leader of his people, but so is the sheikh. If the state is strong, the tribe is weak, Al-Khalid explains. Because in recent years we've had less rule of law, we've had to step in. When clashes broke out in Attaq in mid-2019 between Emirati-backed mercenaries allied with southern separatists fighting against government forces, tribal leaders intervened, trying to mediate. We had to stop them destroying our souk, says Al-Khalid. When he says the souk, or market, he means the whole city of Attaq. By tribal law, there must never be weapons raised in the souk. It's seen as a protected space because all depend on it for survival. Many tribesmen in Shabwa still live traditionally, in tall, intricate mudbrick houses near water sources and perched atop the hills that line the area's wadis, or valley streams. But they depend on the city for trade, healthcare, news and education. Modernity is a double-edged sword. The tribe can provide protection and support, but not key infrastructure like roads and jobs and essential services. Of course we hope for our children to be educated and live in a strong, stable state which reduces the tribes to just an honorific, says Sheikh Saleh Jarbu of the Nisi tribe. Everyone here still respects tradition, but they also want the central government to remember and serve them. Since the clashes in late 2019, Shabwa has been firmly under the control of the central government, and many now hope a period of peace will lead to prosperity. The area's natural resources should help, chief among them oil and natural gas. But ever since oil was discovered in the country, more than 40 years ago, it's been a source of contention. Only three of Yemen's 22 governorates have oil, and Shabwa is one of them. But before the war, all the proceeds went into the central coffers. The tribes feel this is their land, and as such, their oil, and accuse past governments of trying to steal their wealth. In 2014, when Al-Qaeda was at the height of its influence in the area, recruitment videos targeted Shabwa's young men, telling them the government and foreign investors were trying to steal these resources from under their feet. A few decades earlier, an Awlaki tribesman tried to petition the previous president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, to hand over an oil field after producing a tribal land deed stating the area belonged to the Awlakis to the seventh level of earth and the seventh level of heaven, meaning it included anything under the ground, too. He came away empty-handed. But now, Shabwa's new governor has sketched out a deal with the central government that allows Shabwa to keep a fifth of the oil revenue from the province, which will be allocated to local infrastructure and services. In doing so, he's won the backing of the tribes. I've often been struck by the way in which the many Bedouin communities I've spent time with in my reporting feel about their connection to place and the nature that surrounds them. But there's something unique about the way these men speak of their history, their very identity intertwined with every curve and crevice of this land. They are rooted as deeply in this earth as the scattered wild shrubs that cling to the mink-grey sand around us, and they defend it just as fiercely, one errant step, and you'll find your ankle pierced by a protective desert thorn. We gather around the meal spread on the floor of the tent. Masuba, sticky, risen wheat soaked in rich honey and sesame oil, and wide, flat trays of rice, goat meat, and neon red zawahir, a spicy salsa. Some of the younger men explain the order of the meal. The goat's heart is placed in front of the guest to prove the whole animal has been slaughtered while the fillets around the spine are saved for the cook as a mark of respect. Despite the fast pace of development here, and the challenges of poverty and war, the old ways endure. Young boys crouch at the entrance to the tent, fingering the AK-47 slung over their shoulders as they watch their fathers wax lyrical about politics. The guns aren't loaded, they're just ceremonial for the grand gathering. When they're actually granted permanent weapons, at 15 or 16, these boys will be considered men, and bound by the obligations of asabiya, tribal loyalty and communal responsibility. Muhammad is ten. When I ask if he's proud to be a tribesman, he cocks an incredulous eyebrow at me. Of course I'm proud. I'm an awlaki. Sayyaf, who's fourteen, says he wants to be a doctor in the city, but doesn't see why that would be incompatible with staying true to his roots. A doctor is a doctor, and a tribesman is a tribesman. And as a tribesman, in hard times, you know you're among friends.